You're listening to the winning literary show, Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio, live with host Denise Turney, author of the books Long Walk Up, Portia, Love More Over Me, Spiral, Love Has Many Faces, and Rosetta's Great Hope. Turn up your dial and get ready for a blast of feature author interviews, 411 on book festivals, writing conferences, and so much more. Ready? Let's go. Good Saturday morning out there to those tuning in to Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio, whether you're on Blog Talk Radio, iTunes, or Rainbow Soul. There's so many ways that people tune in to Off the Shelf. So I just want to say good morning with to you. And before I get started, I want to leave this thought from C.S. Lewis with you. Hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. Hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. And again, that's from C.S. Lewis. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our loyal listeners who've been with us for over 14 years now. And to those that might be your first time tuning in to the, the radio show this morning, I just want to let you know that you are listening to the winning book radio show, Off the Shelf. You guys, can you believe, for those of you who celebrate Christmas, that it is next week. This is December the 21st. I mean, this year just blew. I really encourage you, and it's something I do every year, but it's just a consideration. I encourage you to st- sit down and track what you've done this year. You might be surprised just how much you've done. And, and give yourself some kudos for, for the new things you tried, the risk you took, the smart risk you took, the in- internal changes you made and the external changes you made, and then start mapping out what you want to do in 2020, creating a plan, whether it's daily or weekly, how you are going to get there. So this time next year you'll be like, wow, you'll be like C.S. Lewis. Uh, 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 but he shared hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. But I want to welcome you. We have an awesome, talented author on deck for us today, and her book is 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 different. It's, it is a, there's the history piece, and our, we've had uh, authors on who write history, historic novels before, and they really were very popular. Hers is a little different, and she's told me before we went live that she's working on a sequel. So I'm I'm excited to introduce her to you. But before I do, I wanted to ask you how good of a mystery sleuth are you? Do you guys think you can figure out who done it? before it's revealed by the author in a story. But the real core to this book, Love Pour Over Me, it is love. And it's actually there's a soulmate relationship that spans across decades. You get to watch these two people from college when they meet at a college in Pennsylvania. You get to watch them change individually and how it affects them together. Uh, it is I love this love story. So I encourage if you love if that if that's something that you value. But when I talk about love, it's also there's also a complicated father son relationship, and it impacts the man in this soulmate relationship. But he also has four four friends. Now one of them is involved could be involved in this murder, but their friendship also this bond is unbreakable. If if you like mystery and you value love and relationships, I encourage you not to pause. Get a copy of Love Pour Over Me. You can click over an ebook, get it, or print, Amazon, <laughs> Barnes & Noble, Walmart, right now. I would really encourage you not to talk yourself out of it. Get a copy of Love Pour Over Me by Denise Turney today. And let me know how you enjoy Love Pour Over Me. And now let us go and meet our very special off-the-shelf guest, and our special off-the-shelf guest this morning is Diana Forbes, and Diana is passionate about history, particularly the 19th century history. She loves visiting antique shops. She, hers is a keen, she has a keen historic eye, especially around events that may have impacted her ancestors. Now, her debut novel, Mistress Suffragette, I, I enjoy researching for her book, and I love her website and the pictures at her website. Now, this book has garnered recognition in the Saturday Evening Post. It has also won first place prize. It's won several prizes. If you, when, you go, when I get out of her website, you're up, you go over there, and I encourage you to do that. You can see 
just how many awards it's won. But it has also won first place prize in the Missouri Romance Writers of America, Gateway to the Best Contest, and, and numerous other awards. And Diana is online at Diana for Forbes Novels dot com, and I'm gonna spell that D I A N A F O R B E S N O V E L S dot com. Again, that's D I A N A F O R B E S N O V E L S dot com. Forbes like the magazine. So Diana Forbes Novels dot com. Please visit her website to check out her books. And her historical right. I think you'd be in for a treat when you go visit her. You can learn more about her right now by visiting her website and by continuing to listen to this off the shelf books talk radio show. We're so honored to have Diana with us this morning. Please let's give her a warm welcome. Welcome to Off the Shelf, Diana. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. We're, we are excited to, to see what you and hear what you share with us this morning. I really encourage people to visit your website. It's like a different journey going over there with your pictures. It's sort of like going back in time a little bit. So I, I right. always enjoy when I pop in at your website. The first few questions that I ask you, Diana, I ask every guest who comes on off the shelf, just so our listeners can get a little backstory on the writer's and other pe- other guests that we bring on before we launch into their books. So to kick it off, Diana, could you tell off the shelf listeners where you grew up and what life was like for you growing up? Oh, absolutely. I grew up here in Manhattan, and much of my book takes place in Manhattan, but it takes place a century ago in Manhattan. Um, I have always been very interested in history, and a lot of my, like my mother grew up here, my grandmother grew up here, my great-grandmother, you know, grew up here. So for me, writing is partly peeling back the layers and layers and layers of ancestry and just sort of peeking beneath the veil. Uh, You grew up in New York. Oh, my goodness. So in, in Manhattan. Manhattan on top of that. Wow. Yes. What you what all the excitement. I mean that is one that is there is I worked in New York and I'm telling you that is a city that they say it never sleeps, it doesn't and it is as a pace. It has a frenetic pace at times to it. People it's from very, all very the frenetic time. here in especially in Manhattan. It's very, very frantic. Especially this time of year too, you know. But what I'm attracted to is how it used to be, you know, like a hundred years ago. Oh, interesting. So in your research, and I wasn't going to ask you this, has that city always had that pace to it, though, when you do your research? In a way it has, as a matter of fact, because, for example, skyscrapers were going up, you know, in the in the early 19th century, skyscrapers, and then buildings would compete with each other to be taller, you know, so it's always been a place where buildings are torn down and new buildings get put up. And for me, as a writer and also a researcher, I'm looking at what was there before the building that is there now, you know, and then what is there before that one even, and just trying to excavate, you know, the old, old New York. Uh, see, there's a there's a treat there. This is the. Big Apple people come from all over the world, and Diana is taking you back in time. So, Diana, when growing up in Manhattan, what did you dream of becoming when you were a kid? I actually wanted to become a writer. I mean, I know that sounds so cliched, but my aunt gave me a diary when I was, I think, seven. It was a little red leather diary with a locket and a key. And I just started writing in the diary, observations. You know, I would just walk around and write things down all the time. And that habit basically continued, you know, through my life. Um, It was just the beginning of being a writer. So I was going to ask you that. You know, as writers, we all get started differently. But I can tell you many of our guests who come on off the shelf, that that was not what they wanted to do. They wanted to be actors or actresses or models or doctors or lawyers. And it's rare when I ask that question of a guest that they say, oh, I always wanted to be a writer. 
That's, that's I a, always that's, wanted to be a writer, but my parents, you know, sort of dissuaded me because it's very hard, obviously, to make a living as a writer, yeah. and so they always encouraged me to to use it, but to be commercial, you know, to be more commercial, um, to write, you know, commercially, and I did that actually for a long time. Like I was in advertising, you know, before I wrote any books, I was in advertising. So you probably learned a lot, and we can discuss that later in the show for our listeners who are looking for tips. But probably we had a we had our last guest, Ned, who was on. He was in like hospital marketing, and so you learn what what is you learn shortcuts. So it might take somebody else years to learn that'll never work, or this uh, this works better. When you specialize in advertising and marketing, I'm sure that helps you to to introduce your stories to new readers. But first we want to talk about your books. So history, as we said, is a passion of yours. What is it about history? What what appeals to you about history? What do you what makes well, you Well, I'm really to lucky because in my family I'm the person who inherited all of the interesting relics from people who came before me, you know. So I received a box of photographs. And, of course, photography is a relatively new art, you know, but among um, among people, you know, in the late in the in the late um, 1850s and beyond, there were photographs, you know, people did have photographs taken. And I I received photographs and I also received letters from ancestors of mine who were on both sides of the Civil War. So with that kind of research at my fingertips, you know, personal research from members in my family, I really had no choice, you know, but to begin kind of looking around. And I had the idea for my book, Mistress Suffragette, and I was, you know, for me, I was actually looking for which time period to set it in that would make the most sense for the characters as they began to form in my mind. Oh, my goodness. So it's sort of like, it seems like everything, listening to you from your aunt giving you your journal to the history in your family and attracting you, like it almost was placed in your lap. It sounds that way. Now, books like Mistress Suffragette can take years to research. I interviewed, we had a guest on here several years ago, and she loves writing historic novels. And they are very, very popular. But she said, the research is almost finite because you have to be so precise. She said, "If you if you going back to like eighteen or nine, early nineteen hundreds, and you say this deli or restaurant had this kind of napkins or cups or whatever," she said, "Readers will say, oh, they didn't have those kind of <laughs> they didn't have those types of napkins or forks back then." So you have right. to really, really, really do your right. research. How right. much research time? Did you put in while compiling the, you know, the info for Mistress Suffragette? Probably about two or two years approximately. The way I did it, because I believe that research is critical, but I also believe that you can get swallowed up by the research, you know. If you really, you know, because you can always research something more and more thoroughly, you know. And um, so what I did is I took about a year and I read a lot of books that were written in the time period, also nonfiction books about the time period, and also just did a lot of research before I even started writing anything, you know. For about a year, I would write – I would read books that were – took place in the time period that were written now, you know, and I also read books that took place in the time period that were written then. And because I wanted to get the lyricism of the language, but I did not want to write a Henry James novel, you know, because Henry James, fantastic writer that he was, his sentences are four or five lines each, and that I think is too taxing for anybody today to read. So what I wanted to do was kind of wink backwards, wink at the language, you know, and get the the tone of it and the feel of it without actually making it so laborious. Ah, and you know what, in today's readers, especially with the Internet and our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. The novels that really did well years ago might not do so well today. That's true. 
noting they were very well written, but people have, have changed. So what inspired you to write this particular book? Why, why Mistress Suffragette? Suffrag- I was interested. I felt that the women's suffrage movement was not covered particularly well, to be honest. And I felt that everything I had ever seen about it was kind of one note, you know, Um, and that these women were full women, you know, who had real lives. They weren't just one-dimensional. They weren't just about the suffrage movement, you know. They had full lives. They had love lives. You know, they had things that were going on as women in that time period. And I really wanted to explore that. I felt that there were things about the suffrage movement that had not really been um, tapped into in a real way. And so I was interested in that. And my heroine, um, she becomes interested in the women's suffrage movement almost by accident due to some of the unfortunate circumstances that happened in her life. And then she kind of lucks into it. She's not, you know, passionate about it in the beginning, but gradually over the novel, she becomes very passionate about it. Ah, so she kind of just, uh, similarly, it just kind of naturally, organically happens. So... Can you, for those who may not know, because we're going back to the early part of the uh, the nineteen hundreds, we're going we're going back almost hundred years now, definitely yeah. or a little bit more. So for those it's who may more. not know, because everybody's not a history buff, can you tell us what the what is what was the women's suffrage? What was oh okay for those who may not okay. Know? So the women's suffrage movement in particular was a push to get women the right to vote. Uh, women were not allowed to vote. Only men were allowed to vote. And certain people, um, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who's very famous, um, she recognized that uh, women were denied the right to vote. And so state by state by state, you know, over 70 or 90 years even, right, state by state, they would say, okay, well, so women can vote in the state of Wyoming, okay, but they can't vote anywhere else, you know. And state by state, women gained the right to vote, and sometimes the right to vote was taken away, okay. So, like, for example, women gained the right to vote in New Jersey, and then it was taken away. So it was very, 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 very slow, very slow. Now, that's basically what the women's suffrage movement is, but there were other contingents of it. So part of the women's suffrage movement is giving women property rights, you know? Like a woman might inherit a piece of property, but it was considered her husband's property, you know? And so women really didn't have any money, and also they didn't have any career path back then. I mean, the only thing a woman could do for money was basically teach. They could teach or they could tutor. There were no options, you know. And so that that piece, the financial piece, also was one of the things that women were fighting for, something more fair, you know, where they could keep their own earnings and not have it be considered their husband's earnings. Women were really, truly second-class citizens for like hundreds of years. You know that piece that you just shared that their income was con- not to consider their own but their husband's that has really been hidden because the, the the what the message that's been pushed and still is pushed is that women didn't work um uh, and the man gave them all he worked and gave them everything Right. Did that part and in some shared? families that that's might like have been true secret. but in other that's families like in secret. middle class families that wasn't the case you know yeah. So but marriage was- marriage was a financial arrangement, you know, where women would be sort of trying to get married to assure themselves financial security, you know, because they didn't really have any money of their own. So but but at its heart, the women's suffrage movement is about gaining the vote. But there were other pieces of it that are fascinating. Yeah, and so, look, can you 
Will you, and that you're making the story, it's like, oh, my gosh, you want to read this story? Please introduce us to Penelope Stanton. What, what is she like, particularly how old is she, what's her family background like, and what's she like at the start of the story? Right. So Penelope Stanton is, at the start of the story, sort of a pretty privileged person. She's living in Newport, Rhode Island, which was the heart of the Gilded Age. And the book takes place during the year 1893, which is the Gilded Age. And robber barons, you know, were running things, and they owned railroads, and, and there were all these tycoons, you know, living around her family in Newport, Rhode Island. But her family was not that rich. Her family, her father was a banker, you know, and he had kind of like an upper middle class sort of life. And Penelope Stanton thought that she was going to do what every young woman in Newport did, get married, you know, have two children, uh, ride horses, and really lead kind of a privileged life. That was her expectation. That, and that, that's how she is in the beginning of the book. But the rug gets pulled out from under her, and none of her expectations happen, and she is really forced into a situation where she has to earn money. Ah, okay, and then this is where it changed. Now, the book seems to be coming full circle. Uh, there's a, an increasing focus on women's rights today. So it's like this is going. we're going back over 100 years, but there's a lot – Still, in regards like the the pay wage gap, there's a lot still involved today around women. So this is like a a, a great time for the, the book itself, Mistress a Suffragette. What do you think Penelope Stanton would say about today's women's movements, and how would she participate? Well, I I feel like um, the book sort of predicted in a weird way since the Me Too movement, you know, because Penelope it has a very, very difficult relationship with somebody um, who is a womanizer, you know, like the worst kind of womanizer, um, you know, sexual harasser, and she has to, you know, kind of navigate this. And I just want to say, at the time when I was writing this, I always go to many writing groups, and I take thousands of writing classes here in Manhattan, you know, too, to look at my chapters and everything. And a lot of the people here in New York City were like, oh, this would never happen. And when the Me Too movement broke, I mean, it's still happening. All that stuff is still happening, you know. Wow, and people said this would never happen. Yeah, they'd be like, oh, this would never happen. I'm like, it happened. It happened. Believe me, it happened, you know. Now, she's from Rhode Island. Is the story set in Rhode Island, or is it actually in in Manhattan itself? Is that where the heart of the story takes place? Well, she grows up in Rhode Island, but then when the rug is pulled out from underneath her, she is forced to move. I mean, she actually runs away. She runs away to Boston, and so part like the middle of the novel takes place in Boston, and then her increasing involvement in the women's suffrage movement brings her to New York. And so uh, it's like a third, a third, a third. A third takes place in Rhode Island, a third takes place in Boston, and a third takes place in New York. Okay. Can you give us, we, 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 we've, we've talked about Miss Penelope, and I want to definitely ask you about Edgar later, but can you give us more of a, 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 a brief synopsis or an overview of the story? We know it's, they're fighting for women's right to vote. But is there anything else other than I want to talk more about Edgar, but any other characters or overview you could give our listeners about Mistress Suffragette? Yeah, I mean, so Penelope is the smart one in her family, and she's actually getting better grades, and she takes her studies very seriously, much more seriously than her younger sister. But um, there was something called the Panic of 1893, which was the worst depression in the United States before the Great Depression. And Penelope's father, a banker, um, his bank is forced to shutter its doors. And this topples her and Penelope's engagement plans. And she finds herself going to Boston without a job with a friend of hers, a female friend of hers named Lucinda, without a job because her parents 
want to uh, send her to – they just want to send her and to New York and have her send her earnings home to them. And she feels this is chronically unfair that they, they're – you know, her younger sister is allowed to stay in school – and complete her education, but Penelope, the smart one, they feel like she's so smart that she should be sending her earnings back home, and she feels very betrayed, particularly by her father, you know, and so he's he's a, he's a character in the book, and as is her mother, and she and her best friend end up going to Boston, and it's funny because it's her best friend who's really interested in the women's suffrage movement. Penelope was raised very traditionally, and she's really opposed to it in the beginning because her mother is opposed to it, you know, and she sort of adopted her mother's view of life as sort of a privileged girl, and then she lucks into it by accident almost and then it begins to really take hold within her you know and she realizes like how significant it is and how important it is for women to have a voice you know because her parents by doing that by saying you know just go go and send us money and everything they're sort of taking away they took away her future you know and so she feels really super betrayed by them that's the first betrayal in the book this is shocking to me that that I'm just shocked. I that I had no idea that women went to work and sent money back home, or that in some relationships, marriages, what the woman earned was belonged to the man. That the yeah. story has always been told. It's always been told the other way. I've never right. heard that. It's always been right. that the man took care of the woman, and I know that happened a lot, but. Everything she had, it came from a, a man, and the, the family always took care of the woman. That this that is like shocking. Right. <laughs> it's shocking. So right, sure there's I'm so much. I mean, really, honestly, shocked. there's like, so never... much. There's so much of this movement that people do not know about. It's just, it's amazing to me. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, it is. I just listening to so, Mr. Edgar Daggers. Yes. Is he what you would consider to be a good man? And, and why Why do you say, why would you share that opinion? I feel Edgar? that he is really, in a way, he's the antagonist um, for Penelope because he's very wealthy, you know, he's very married, and he he comes on to her and he makes it very difficult to sort of escape from him you know, because he's got so much power and so much money. And while he has a magnetic personality, he also, I think, tries to manipulate her into something that would be kind of a bad situation for her. You know, he kind of manip- tries to manipulate her with his money and his power uh, to be involved with him, to have an affair with him. And in a way, you know, is counter opposite of what the women's suffrage movement is about and i wanted to bring it you know to a personal level you know what i mean i mean i'm not writing i mean i'm writing about the movement as a backdrop in my book but i mean i'm writing about characters people and the choices you know that we have to make and sometimes the choices are very very difficult you know it's like she could work for sort of a couple of dollars you know and be a real person and honest to herself you know or she could be treated very lavishly by this man but as his mistress so uh, i want to give her a tough choice to make ah and very very very, mr egger so is he is he charming i'm seeing an old guy is he like the charmer He's charming. He's, he's charming. Man. He's magnetic. You know, he's very smart. Oh, wow. He's very he's well raised, you know, from a very privileged background, and he's one of the few people at the time who's actually doing well, you know, too. So, I mean, during a during a depression, during a panic, you know, people are losing their houses, they're losing their life savings, you know. It's a catastrophe. And uh, one of his appeals is that he's actually doing very well while others are failing, too, you know. I wanted to make the choice hard for her because I believe that, you know, kind of like the quote that you said in the beginning of this show, I feel like it's the obstacles, you know, that make somebody strong. 
Yes, and and, and I want to ask you next, so Miss Penelope, I hope she's one tough, smart cookie boy. I hope she is. Um, so, Edgar, to introduce us to his wife. I mean, is this not just Miss Penelope, but Edgar, like you said, he's very married. What is his wife like? So his wife is a young socialite, and at that time, you know, in the 1890s, I mean, there were people, and, you know, their sort of their career would be to be a socialite, you know what I mean? Like, not to earn money, but to just be social. So she's a very young socialite, and she's married to him, and um, she, she, you know, they seem, on the surface, they seem really beautiful, you know, they're both very handsome, you know, they dance well together at balls and everything, um, but she, it's, you know, I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but, you know, she's on to him, we learn later in the book, she's on to him, his shenanigans. Good for her, good for yeah, her. Yeah, good for her. Man. <laughs> and, 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 and that's what women still are, that's something women still want, a powerful, wealthy man who they think could take care of them as much as we've come 100 years along with that still. That's still the main catch. The guy who's struggling, no woman's looking for that dude. Right, so why, unfortunately, why you is, know, right. And why is Edgar pursuing her? What is it about her? Does, is it, does he think he can control her? Does he think she's new in town, she doesn't know any better? Why is he after her? Well, he has a, his backstory is that he has – a lot of um, relationships, affairs with bit actresses and people uh, who just are really after him for his money, you know. And when he meets her, like she seems interesting and she's very beautiful. Penelope's very beautiful. And he just looks at her as a conquest, quite honestly, I think, you know. Um, and anyway, their relationship, you know, it, it goes on throughout. I mean, she has other relationships with other men, but this one, you know, he pursues her, you know, he, he's very, very, he's sort of dangerous. I would say, you know, he's dangerous. Mm. Okay. So he's really, really coming after her. Now, how old were women expected to marry in the, uh, late 1800s where they expected you should now my grandmother had told me that if you were 18 when she was young and you weren't married and didn't have a child 21 max you were they called referred to you as an old maid and people thought something was wrong with you so when back when the story takes place with penelope did she feel pressure how old were women expected to marry it during this time and right. is she at the age where she would be having pressure put on her that you better find somebody and get married? Well, her yes. Her parents, it's actually double pressure because she's 17 and a half when the story starts. And at the end of the story, she's 18 and a half. Um, yeah, the reason that her parents want her to sort of find somebody so badly is because of their financial situation. You know, they want her to find the person the she is um through an arranged marriage arranged to marry somebody that they know and then he pulls out okay and so once he pulls out it puts enormous pressure on penelope to find somebody fast to be with you know so that her fate her life will be taken care of. Again, in a situation where women basically didn't take care of themselves most of the time, marriage was usually considered to be the best option. So her parents put a tremendous amount of pressure on her. Now, Penelope's personality is that she doesn't tell her parents everything, you know. That's part of the way that she is. She hold, She withholds. She holds it back. You know, she doesn't want them to suffer like one more embarrassment, you know, and she doesn't tell them everything or whatever. So they put a lot of pressure on her, and it's it's very difficult under those circumstances. Everybody wanted to get married, you know, so there was like a lot of competition that she faced. And also she thought she was going to marry somebody else, you know. So it's like everything is just taken away from her, and then she has to sort of survive. Oh, my goodness. I saw, you know, you can fall in love with this Penelope just listening to you talk about her on this off-the-shelf interview. So you talk, we talk about her, her parents. What were her, I want to be curious, curious if our listeners also want to know, 
What was her relationship like if she had siblings? And also, you said she didn't tell her parents everything. I'm getting this feeling that was she not close to her mother? What was her relationship like with her parents? And if she had siblings, her, she seems like a very independent thinker. She's going to do her own thing. What was her relationship like with her parents, particularly her mother? And then also if she had siblings, what, what was her relationship like with them? So she has one sister, and her relationship with her sister is that Penelope is very jealous of her sister because her sister oh is very traditional. Her sister goes with the flow. You know, her sister is able to kind of, she's a traditional person. She's able to sort of flirt with people, you know, giggle a lot, laugh, be lighthearted. And Penelope is very jealous. It's like her sister, her younger sister is the favored child, you know, and she's very jealous of her in the beginning of the book. But, you know, things happen. And I think that, that the relationship, the jealousy that, uh, Penelope feels, I think she, Penelope redeems herself late in the book with that one, you know. She realizes, like, the error of her ways with it, and, and I think that that's important, you know. And with her father, I mean, her father recognizes that Penelope is super smart, and he thinks of her almost like a man, and that's how the, <laughs> that's how the whole thing begins, where it's like he wants to send her away to earn money to help the family, you know, out of their out of their predicament, um, and she feels um, that it's chronically unfair, but the truth is he feels like her her sister, Lydia, is not smart enough to do it, you know? So it's, it's kind of like a compliment. <laughs> it's like a backhanded compliment. Like, you're too smart, so you should, like, go earn all the money, you know, and salvage, you know, keep us in our home and, like, keep us propped upright or whatever, and she really is – feels terribly upset about it, and her mom is um, very overbearing. I think her mother means well, uh, but basically her mother wants to protect her, you know, like a, like an overbearing hen, you know. Um, she wants to protect her, and but I think that, um, you know, I wanted the mom to be a humorous character. I wanted the mother to be, you know, comedic to the reader because there is a lot of tragedy that's happening in the book. There's a lot of things and I wanted I want, you know, the book to be fun and lighthearted and engaging to read, you know? Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. the mother is very you know, sincere, but I want the reader to be laughing, you know, sometimes. And that yes, yes. And you and but the father listening to you, he doesn't feel any type of like as a man like I'm actually asking my daughter to help us keep us in our home, and I'm the man. I'm right. thinking he's feeling pretty bad about himself to even have to do that, especially in those – today it, I think it would bother a lot of men. And then especially back then it would be like he would – I don't know how would he feel about himself, that I'm asking my daughter to help keep the lights on. Right, exactly, to save the farm, you know, basically. Um, but anyway, you know, I just wanted her to have a lot of challenges, you know. I, and, I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but later she actually does figure out a way, you know, to help her parents save the house. Um, so okay, I believe well, the no, characters, it... they have to, characters have to face, like, very steep problems and obstacles almost to get become themselves you know like scarlett o'hara you know what i mean it's like with atlanta burning you know what i mean like she found the resolve i believe that this is important for people's growth you know what i mean to just face really high obstacles tough hurdles what was what was newport rhode island like at the time the story takes place if you could take us back in time and make us feel like we were right back there with Penelope and her family. What was Newport, Rhode Island like? How could you, would you describe it for us? Okay. It was a playground for the rich. It, everybody had, not Penelope, but around them, the rich would build these massively large mansions. And each mansion was larger than the one next to it, you know, to compete. And there would be things, you know, rooms made out of 18-karat gold, 
you know, this type of thing. And people were just, most of the people who lived there, they would build these humongous houses and only be there during the summer months, you know. It was a summer community that became a playground for the rich. And Penelope's family is upper middle class, and they're living there full year round, so they're not like everybody else really around them. But they would have these parties, you know. They would have parties and parties, parties on yachts, right? Parties. I read um, this autobiography. They would have, like, birthday parties for dogs. You know, people would Whoa. bring their poodles. Something that is happening today again, actually, yes, but I'm saying yeah. back then, you know. Um, it was just how much money can we show off? How much money can we spend, you know? And the people who were there were tycoons. They owned railroads, you know. Um, they owned, you know, huge businesses. Um, and they would just, this would be their summer quote unquote cottages that were really like large, 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 very excessive, you know, spending of money and wealth. And of course, you know, the panic, the Great Depression, this is the Great Depression before the Great Depression of the 30s, you know, the panic of 1893, you know, a lot of people's wealth was just swallowed up in that, you know. The railroads were overbuilt. I mean, there were lots of things that contributed to people like just losing and losing a lot of money, you know. So against this background, you know, the wealthy, the truly wealthy, we were like out there having their parties while the rest of the country was like suffering a huge, huge depression. People were unemployed for four years, you know. Yeah. So anyway, I, I love so they were, the time I, They were period. sort of isolated then. It seemed like they were isolated. They had so much wealth that they didn't even were what was happening to the rest of the country was not touching. Right, that's them, true. Them that's true. To some extent, it's true unless they lost their money, you know. But yeah, it's so so anyway. I loved the time period because it was like what I you know I felt like I was sort of showing the dark side of the Gilded Age. Too. Like, we feel like the Gilded Age, oh, it's so interesting because, you know, there was so much going on. There was the Industrial Revolution was happening. You know, oh, all these technological advances were happening. It's just everybody thinks of it as like, oh, it's so glitzy. But the truth was there was this huge depression going on. And so I'm trying to show, like, the underside of the Gilded Age. Mm. Now, are most women in Newport during this time? I mean, you've got these people have so much money the the concerns that uh people who weren't in those financial situations their concerns just like now the, somebody with, with wealth they don't have those same concerns it's almost like they're living in a whole nother world now are most women in newport are they submissive or are they starting to change becoming more independent and i ask that in particular because if they're living these lifestyles and they're, I mean, they just money is just there's no limit to it, and they're thinking I'm, this is as good as it gets. Certainly, I would think those women wouldn't want to do anything to disturb that. So are right. they are they submissive or are they starting to change and becoming more independent? They they were beginning to change because the women's suffrage movement really like the heart of it was in Boston. It was in Boston at that time period, you know, and Boston is very close to Rhode Island. It's not very far away, you know. Um, so I'm saying, you know, in Massachusetts, right, you know, one state over, it was like the, the, the hotbed of the women's suffrage movement. And there were all kinds of women's clubs, and it was very, very, you know, growing, growing. So some of it was spilling over to Rhode Island. And, of course, later than my book takes place, but, of course, I mean, Alva Vanderbilt was, you know, one of the people who was at the very head of the movement, and she had, you know, many mansions in Newport, Rhode Island, and she was unbelievably wealthy, but she took the cause, you know. So that's sometimes what would happen. Very rich people would get very excited about having more power, you know, and that would infuse other people with, uh, you know, interest in it. And the reason it, it, I picked this year is because it was a time of change. Ah, uh, so it, initially, women who did gain the right to vote, 
they were property owners. Is that correct or or no? When the they property. no, I mean it's it it's it's no. I mean it, some were some weren't. I mean many of the people who were the leaders of the women's suffrage movement were married. You know, had husbands, had families, et cetera. Um, so yeah. And then I wanted to ask you before I start talking about the the process of writing the book, did they work with uh, suffrage movements in other countries that that were going on as well for women? That's a really great question because you know in New Zealand, women won the right to vote way before they did here in the U.S. And in London, you know the suffrage movement there, which took that was more like um, a little bit more anarchy like i mean there there were you know a lot of there were a lot of protests people you know women went to prison there were hunger strikes um and i would say no there was not very much cross pollination of ideas um i don't think that the the people in the us were really working very hard with um you know the people in england at the time or in new zealand no so that's unfortunate that they weren't Okay. And then I want to ask you now, if we talk about uh, Penelope, and don't want to give this this story away, so encourage uh, our off-the-shelf listeners again to get a copy of Mrs. Stris Suffragette and visit Diana Forbes online at dianaforbesnovels.com to learn more about her books and, of course, to get a copy of her book. But now I want to talk about the um, the writing aspect. Just You said it took you about two years to do the research of the book. You didn't want to over-research, but that's still a, a great deal of time. How long did it take you to actually sit down? You've done all this research. You've compiled all this data and information. How long did it take you to write Mistress Suffragette? So I, I did the research, and then I would say the book took – about two years to write. So I did about two years of research, and then I, I spent about two years writing the book. And then I also, then at the end, I went back and I re-researched everything. <laughs> wow. Because, yeah, because whoever your listeners, you know, whoever it was that said that you have to know everything, the teacups, the menu, you know, did they have lace doilies, you know, or were there paper, you know, this type of thing. Um, because I really want to make sure I was accurate. So I I visited every single building in my book that still exists. Oh, I my went goodness. physically to the place. Yeah, you know, I yes, I went, I took pictures, I took pictures of things like menus, you know. I took pictures of things like suffrage memorabilia. I mean, I, I you, it's mandatory, I think, with historical fiction to actually physically go. Wow, you did your work so for the readers. Oh my goodness. So how many buildings did you did you revisit that were still the way they were a hundred years ago? I'm assuming not that many. But were a lot of them still the uh, in their original I can imagine, but were they? Yeah, I mean you right. I would what I'm saying is I would go to the actual place you know i would go like okay newport mansions that's easy because they're still around you know and i'd go in them and i would take tours of them historical tours and you know historical reenactments and things like that i did all that and then if the building doesn't ex- didn't exist doesn't exist i would also go i would go to the physical spot because I wanted, you know, a lot of times, okay, the building doesn't exist, but let's say here in New York, right, maybe the building doesn't exist, but there's a plaque there where it was, you know. I wanted to get the flavor of, like, oh, you know, maybe now in New York, like you're walking by the New York Public Library, but it used to be this, you know. I wanted it people to feel it, taste it, smell it, you know, and walk around, you know, with my with my character, I gotta applaud you for that. I I know when I wrote on uh, Love Has Many Faces, I actually went to New York, and and I think it I think it helps to actually. But I didn't visit every site like you did, so I I salute you for that. Now, what writing process do you follow? You you mentioned earlier that you work with a lot of writing groups when you when you're doing your work, but when you're actually writing a a novel, do you use outlines, character sketches? What's the process of 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 actually developing 
the novel for you. Right. So some people, you know, are are plotters and some people are pantsers, you know, and I feel like I'm both because I will just so the first when I sit down for the first 50 pages or something, I just write, you know, 50 pages or whatever. And then after I get like to a certain point where I myself have so many questions, you know, then I begin outlining like the characters and their arcs and what they want. And, you know, I, I do the plotting like after I've already written like 50 or 60 pages. And then in this case, I think this is a good thing. You know, I plotted out the novel. I had every scene plotted out. And then, you know, the characters just completely ignored me, and they just did what they wanted to do, you know. And so so I kept re-outlining the book to keep up with what they were doing. And at the very, very end, I outlined the entire thing all over again, you know, to <laughs> just to make sure that it all worked because things had happened that I had not anticipated. So I kind of let the characters do what they're going to do, too. You know, and you hear so many writers say that, and for people who don't write, it might sound so weird. <laughs> yes. I've heard writers say they have dreams with the characters. The characters tell them, you know, certain things have to happen to them in the book. And and it's almost like the writer is just telling the, this story for for the character once her his story told. What have readers been saying about Mistress Suffragette? I feel like the reviews have been really, really positive. I mean, I, for example, first of all, you know, it, it's gotten a lot of reviews, and I'm really grateful for that. But I also sometimes, you know, I might know the person, and uh, like I've run into people in my building, you know, who will stop me and say, oh, I read it, and da da da, and here's what I think. And so, you know, it's been really, really, really exciting. And by the way, for anybody out there who's writing historical fiction right now, I do actually think that spending the extra time to research the places really makes it better, more authentic, you know, because um, you want it to feel real. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So readers have really been enjoying. Any favorite characters for re- readers, any characters that they just love not to like? Well, I think I think Daggers, you know, is one of those people, like, you love to hate them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is I'm working on this sequel now and I'm almost finished it and um I'm very excited about it and th- to me the thing was like I you know I finished writing it and I closed the book and then it just later I was like you know I'm not the story is still going on it was still mm. going on in my head so several of the characters are back in the sequel um you know okay Oh, I, I'm sure we'll see Miss Penelope and, and and Edgar again. Can you share three to four steps that you take, uh, Diana, that you found to be effective at getting the word out about your books? So I always research a lot of you know promotional opportunities. And what I try to do is I just try them first, you know, and, um, you know, they cost money, unfortunately, or whatever, but it's like I try them and then I see, you know, what seems to uh, move the needle. But, you know, the best thing anybody can do for their own book is get, you know, have, when you first publish, have a lot of parties, get the book into people's hands, you know, I would say is like very, very important. Try to get into book clubs. Try to get it into libraries, you know. Try to have different sources, outlets. Especially today, we all need so many outlets for our books. I would agree with that. So not not just online, but offline. And then, like a, I used to think, why would you give your book away? Well, again, you you even if you just give a few chapters away, you want to get people introduced to your book and start to talk about the book. That that is very, right. very important. Now you said you're right. working on a sequel. Can you give us a glimpse? What time period will this sequel take place in and and where will these characters be? Will they be in Boston, New York or, or Rhode Island in the sequel? Um I'm they it takes place um about four years later. Um it's done, it's not just one year though, you know. And um I'm seeing them in Manhattan mostly, but there are some other spots in the book too, you know, where they go. And um like I said, I thought I had just finished the story, 
when I when I sort of just sent it off and it, the book was published, and then I realized later, like, oh no, as a matter of fact, there's a lot more here. So mm. I just think it's really fun, you know, <laughs> to just keep writing it and. You know, I'm having and a will they still time. be in in the woman's? Uh, is there, it, they're still yes. dealing with the same? Okay, yes. they're still dealing with the same issues. Yes, because the, the, like the, like the women's movement, it just took so long. <laughs> a lot so of work. Plenty, a lot there's of work. plenty there, you know. And there's like yes, and it took the women's suffrage movement took many turns too. So ah, now we learn so much about ourselves while we're creating. Diana, what have you learned about yourself? Since you wrote women's the the suffrage, what what Mr. Suffrage? What did you learn about yourself at the end? You're like, oh, you know what? This is what I learned about myself in writing this book. Well, I just you know it's not it's not always easy to get published, and I felt like um, you know it's an endurance test, kind of like what you're doing, what I do with my protagonist. It's like you know getting it published is an endurance test, and you know I felt like. I'm just going to get this damn thing published, <laughs> you know, and I just kept going. I just kept going. Sometimes, you know, tenacity, I think, conquers a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. So you learn to just just keep going. You saw that, 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 like Penelope, you saw that inner strength in yourself. Now, what advice do you have for someone who's looking to write, publish, and market a book? Somebody who's never done it before, they're very passionate about doing it, if they're not where you are yet, what advice would you share with them? The best thing I think I've ever done is I have a commitment to taking a lot of writing classes. And, you know, I take writing classes all the time. And I try to take ones for character and also, you know, I try to take a lot of plot seminars and things like that. And you could just can always, always, no matter how great you are as a writer, you can always get better and you can always learn how readers are taking your work. And I take a lot of classes, and I run every chapter by a lot of people. And I learn mm. what they think, you know, and like, oh, what's the problem with the chapter? And then I will go back, and I will try to fix the problem. Let me ask you this, because I've, I've – and, and, and I'm sure a lot of writers are part of writers' groups – how do you the the group is is uh, they're generally people who've published before themselves. Do you allow if you're very passionate about something, do you allow somebody saying, "But I don't like that," or it's moving too slow, or whatever, to influence your writing? How do you keep it so that it's still your voice and not not the the, the people in the writing group or the other people giving you feedback? It doesn't become their story, right? That's a great question. I mean, basically, one piece of advice that I received that I guess I'll pass on is that when you get revisions, that's not the day to rewrite it, okay? You go you to your writing group or to your writing class, you're going to get a lot of input and a lot of feedback, and some people won't like it, and some people will love it, and, you know, there's a lot of conflicting advice often. So I always think it's a good idea to let it sift. Let it sift. Like, you know, you go in and then don't revise it for another month, you know, and just or or maybe take the biggest revisions that they give you and do that forward. Revise forward, not backward. Take what they say and, and use it to make the next chapter better, but don't go back and revise until it's sat for a long time and you've let it, like the feedback, sit. Let it sit. The best thing for a book, honestly, is to let it sit as much as you can. And and then, you know, you see what the problems are, and you're not relying on other people to point them out. Mm, interesting, interesting. So writers, groups, and they are beneficial because you might think something is so swell and somebody else may tell you your writing is good, but there's there's nothing about this description or your especially when you start selling books, your description, it just doesn't entice me to want to buy this book. So right, it, right, it does, right. It does help to get to get that feedback. Now, what, where can off the shelf listeners get a copy of Mistress Suffragette? Okay, thank you so much for asking. Um, go to Amazon and buy it there. It's available in paperback. It's available on Kindle, and it's also available in, in Audible, in Audible form. So you can listen to it if you like. And that's taken off. So very, very, very good. Uh, where can people find you on social media networks, Diana? 
Okay, I'm on Facebook. Um, I'm on Twitter. I'm trying to thinking like, but what is my, you know, um, I think you can just look me up and find me that way. You know, I'm out there. I'm trying to push the book. <laughs> Okay, okay. And go, go to dianaforbesnovels.com, and all the social media that I'm on is there. So. Okay. So so we have been honored to have with us, as we wrap up today's show, Miss Diana Forbes, and her name is spelled just like the magazine, F-O-R-B-E-S, with us. She is the author of Mistress Suffragette. She's working on the sequel, which should be out shortly. If, if you came in midstream, on today's inter- uh, interview, after it finishes streaming, you can go back to the archives and listen to it in its entirety and share it with book lovers everywhere, especially people who love the women's movement, women empowerment, and and history. But just those who love a good story, you can share the the link to the interview once you finish ar- archiving with them. And please go vi- visit Miss Diana Forbes online. Again, she's at dianaforbesnovels dot com. D I A N A F O R B E S N O V E L S dot com. Diana Forbes dot com. We want to thank Diana for being here with us. And again, she's the author of Mistress Suffragette. Encourage you to go out and get a copy of her book and, and support her. And I want to wish everybody here because I will see you here next Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or New York City Time. But then the holidays will be passed for those of you who celebrate Christmas. So I want to say right now, happy holidays, Merry Christmas to you. And pretty soon I'll be saying Happy New Year, but happy, happy holidays. Merry Christmas. I hope you spend time with family, friends, or if you spend time alone, I wish you so much happiness and peace and joy. If you're alone, do something fun. Do something fun. You can have fun even if you you're in a situation where you're not close or nearby you might be in the military not near family and friends i just wish you happy holidays and remember you are so awesome you're incredible you're amazing go out and create a fabulous day for yourself diana i'll shoot you an email thank you so much bye for now thank you very very much and happy holidays everybody